Well, good morning again. Good morning. I am so thankful to have this opportunity to be with you again this morning. Uh, though, again, I do wish it was under better circumstances. Um, this morning, as we're continuing to continue into the beginning of the Christmas season, as I begin preparing this message, I had reached out to Brother Kelly this past week to ask him what he had in store, what he had planned for this Advent season, this coming season where we remember the coming and birth of Christ. He shared with me some of his desires and his goals and hopes uh, as we walk through this holiday season, and I'm very, very excited uh, for what the Lord has in store for us in our next several worship sessions. But before we have our minds focused, before we have our minds focused on the traditional nativity story of Mary and Joseph, the angels and the manger and the little baby, let us remember that God's plan for the redemption of mankind has been his plan since the very beginning for his son Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, to be sent to live in flesh, to live a perfect life that we could never live, to die the death that we deserve, and to have the resurrection that gives us hope for our own resurrection. Over a year ago, uh, I was blessed to visit my wife's home church in Memphis and to hear an amazing message uh, preached by a pastor who walked his congregation through the whole Old Testament, pointing towards the birth of Christ. Today, we're going to go on a similar journey, um, and a journey where I believe that we should all begin, where every story begins, and that is in the beginning. I do not have, unfortunately, any PowerPoint slides for you of Scripture so if you have a Bible open or if you have a Bible app, I would encourage you to grab it. And we're going to be going through pretty much most of the Old Testament. So be prepared. And like I said, we're going to begin where all stories begin in the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. In the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. See, the creation of all things began with a God who perfectly and lovingly created a world that would reflect Him and His glory. He would have communion and relationship with His creation that would not be hindered by sin or separation. Light would shine over his creation that radiated from him and would illuminate the beauty and majesty of all that he had created. By the sixth day of creation, however, God created that which we would place in authority and dominion over his garden and all within it. Drop down to, chap I'm sorry, verse 26, still in chapter 1. In verse 26, the writer says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Adam the forerunner and patriarch of all mankind, as long as his wife Eve, the matriarch of all humanity, were given power and authority over all of the earth. They were given only one command that could not be broken. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Adam and Eve were to be the first of all who would live forever in perfect harmony and relation with their creator. And all who would never know the pain of death. However, soon after that, there would be one who would enter the garden. One who would be disguised as a deceptive servant. Who would stir feelings and doubts of God's word into the minds of Adam and Eve. That would bring about deception, betrayal, lies, and ultimately the sting of death that would be brought upon all of mankind. Genesis chapter 3 then recounts the story of the serpent, who was the enemy Satan, accused in the sky, who had entered the garden, brought deception, and brought death. Adam, in his passive weakness, failed to protect not only his bride, but he failed to protect all those who would ever walk on the perfect creation. Eve had taken the fruit she had doubted what God had said, consumed the fruit, and gave it to her husband to share with her. 
Because of this first sin, all of creation would now be marred with sin and death. The Lord quickly brings their sin to light. He removes the darkness, shows his light, so it illuminates their eyes to see where they had fallen short. Because of their sin, they had been exposed and recognized their nakedness. To try to hide their nakedness, they would gather leaves to to sew them together to make coverings. When God said, why have you done this? They said, we're naked. He said, how do you know that you were naked? Because their eyes had been exposed. So God did two things. Two things before he cast them out of the garden. First, God had made a promise to Satan, the accuser, the deceiver, that there would be a shining light of hope in the darkness. That this light of hope would be the great undoing that would be good news for us, but it would signal death and defeat for the enemy. Genesis 3, 14 through 15 writes, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock, above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And verse 15 says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now verse 14 gives a curse upon all servants that is still enacted to this day. But in verse 15, God shifts the focus of his conversation specifically to Adam and Eve. I'm sorry, forgive me. He says he shifts the conversation specifically to the serpent. He pronounces upon him death and destruction for eternity. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 is what th- Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 is what theologians refer to as the proto evangelium. Proto meaning first or beginning, evangelium meaning good news. Evangelium is where we get evangel, or evangelical, the gospel, the good news. This is the first good news in all of Scripture that promises hope and redemption for all of man. The second thing that God did was to take the life of an innocent animal, shedding its blood for the forgiveness of Adam and Eve's sins. He then took the skin of the animal. He made a covering for the couple to hide not only their nakedness, but that would also be a covering that would cover their sins. I can't even imagine what it must have been like. Adam and Eve cared for these animals. They watched over them. They loved them. They nurtured them. They'd never known what death was. They never knew what pain was. They, never knew, they probably never even saw blood being shed at all before because they never endured hardships like that post their sin or pre their sin. However, when Adam sinned and Eve sinned, it caused sin to enter the world. And when sin enters the world, also enters death. So I cannot imagine what it must have been like for them to witness the death of an animal, the taking of its life, the blood being poured out, and the skins of it being used to cover them because of their transgressions and their sins and their failures. These two things that God does points us to a future event, a promised event, a day that will come when the promised seed of Adam will come and he will crush the head of the enemy by being himself a sacrificial lamb whose blood will be spilt for the forgiveness of sin. When Adam and Eve left the garden, they begin to populate the earth. They are sent out. They conceive and bear children. Generation after generation are born. Families are born and they grow into this world. And there was a man who the Lord called to that was a descendant of Adam and Eve. His name was Abram. Now Abram, whose wife was named Sarai, was about 75 years old when God reaches out to him. And when he's 75, he has no heir. He has no children. And God makes a promise to him. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, God makes a promise to Abram that he'll be the father of a great and promised land. Genesis chapter 12. In verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord God said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and so you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will dishonor him who curse. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Not only did Abraham receive the promise from God that he would be the father of a great nation. 
God promised him that through his family line, he would bless all the families of the earth. God continues to assure Abram that through him and his line, a great nation will rise up. And Abram waited. He waited and waited and waited for the promised son, the son through whom would be the blessings of a great nation. And one night he cries out of God in his impatience and his waiting and his longing for an heir. He cries out the Lord that he's still childless and waited longingly for the promise to be fulfilled. In Genesis 15, Genesis 15, 1 through 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield, and your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. The heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring. And a member of my household, he's supposed to be my heir? The word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and he said, look, Abram, look towards the heavens. Look at the scars. Try to number them if you can even. As countless as they are, so shall be your offspring. And Abram believed the Lord and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, not only had God promised this great nation will be as immeasurable as the stars in the sky, as uncountable as the sands of the seashore, this nation promised to Abram will be truly vast. And through this nation, one will come that be a blessing to all nations, to all peoples of the whole earth. However, shortly after that promise was reassured in the same night, Abram falls into a deep, deep sleep, and a dark and terrible vision dream comes over Abram. Look down at verses 12 through 16. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. The Lord said to Abram, Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there. They will be afflicted for 400 years, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation. This great nation promised to Abram, the nation that would bless the whole earth, would one day suffer through 400 years of captivity. Generations will die, generations will be born in slavery and in bondage. But after four generations, they will be free. They will return to the land promised to them. And not only that, but they will return with great wealth. In Genesis 21, after 25 years of waiting, the promised son was finally born. His name was Isaac. Abraham was, Abram was named, has now been changed to Abraham. And he had finally received the promised son that he had longed for and finally received. However, in Genesis 22, God would test the faithfulness of Abraham. God would call Abraham to make a sacrifice to the Lord. And this sacrifice would not be a calf or a lamb, but God would call Abraham to sacrifice that which was most precious to him, the son that he had longed for for over 25 years. Abraham was now 100 years old. He finally had the son that he wanted, and God was calling him to put that son to death to show his faithfulness to the Lord. 22, Genesis 22, starting in verse 1. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two young men with, two young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut for wood the burnt offering, arose and went to the place which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering. He laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took his hand, the fire and the knife. They went both of them together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father. Abraham said, Here I am. Isaac said, Behold, the fire and the wood But where is the lamb for the offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself a lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they both went out together. When they came to a place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar and laid the wood 
Then he bound up his son Isaac and laid his son, his promised son, on that altar to sacrifice him. On there, on top of the wood, Abraham took in his hand a knife. He reached out his hand. He lifted it up to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord stopped him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on, your, on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. And seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram, caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. An angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this, and you have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand on the seashore. And your offering shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. God was faithful to Abraham because Abraham was faithful to God. And God took Isaac, Isaac the long-awaited son, whom Abraham loved desperately and spared his life. As we journey through this story and continue on, we know that there will be one coming. We know that one who is, the one who is coming will be the promised seed of Adam that brings victory over the enemy. One who would be the promised descendant of Abraham that will bless all nations. One who would be the provided sacrificial son that the Heavenly Father would not spare, but with the shedding of his blood will bring peace to all peoples. Our story continues. Isaac grows up. He takes a wife named Rebekah. In Genesis 26, Isaac, God gives Isaac the same promise that he gave to his father Abraham. Isaac and his offspring would be given vastly great lands that they will populate. And like God promised to Abraham, he also promised to Isaac. Genesis chapter, tw- um, sorry, Genesis chapter 26 and verse 4. Genesis 26 verse 4. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven, and I will give to your offspring all of these lands, and in your offspring the, star, the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. God's faithfulness would continue throughout the generations. In Genesis 28, Jacob, the son of Isaac, has a very strange and unique dream given to him by the Lord to remind him of the promise made to his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac. In Genesis 28, verses 10 through 15, the writer writes, Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran, and he came to a certain place and stayed the night there because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. Behold, there was a ladder, a ladder set up on the earth. The top of it reached to heaven. And behold, angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, above the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, the, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. God is reaffirming to Jacob the promise that he made to his grandfather, to his father, that he would make their family into a great nation, a nation as immeasurable as the stars in the heavens, as uncountable as the dust on the ground. And through this great nation, all peoples of the earth will be blessed. But God reveals to Jacob in this dream, not just an earthly blessing, but a heavenly blessing as well, that this promised one who would be coming, this one who would be long awaited for, it would be no coincidence that there is a ladder that ascends and descends from the heavens. For the blessing that comes to all the families on the earth will not just be earthly, but it will be heavenly as well. This blessing shall be as the one who is the promised seed of Adam that brings victory over the enemy. The one who would be the promised descendant of Abraham that would bless all nations. The one who would be the sacrificial son that would not be spared. The one that will now descend from a heavenly throne down this ladder to come to this earth so that through him, through faith in him, all who believe in him will be able to ascend into the heavens. Our story continues. 
as Jacob, whose name is now changed to Israel, is given 12 sons. Through four different women, these sons will be the fathers of the tribes of Israel. The promised nation has finally come. The peoples has finally arisen. However, amongst these brothers, great jealousy rises up in the hearts of these brothers against the second youngest son, whose name is Joseph. The jealousy rages so violently against Joseph, the brothers plot to kill him. There was one brother, Judah. Judah has says, let us not kill him. Instead, let us simply send him into slavery or sell him into slavery and send him away. And we will tell our father that he is dead. Joseph is sold into slavery. He arrives in Egypt. He finds himself working in the house of an Egyptian man named Potiphar. Through a series of events, Joseph is put into prison. While he's in prison, he encounters two prisoners who share visions with him. They pronounce to him these visions, and Joseph tells them to one of them that you will die, the other you will be restored to your place in the kingdom. That person makes a promise to Joseph that Joseph would not be forgotten. Joseph is left in prison. Years pass. The man has forgotten about Joseph. However, Pharaoh of Egypt begins to dream visions of dreams of fattened calves and skinny calves. It represents that there will be seven years of great plenty in the land of Egypt and seven years of famine. Joseph, I'm sorry, Pharaoh does not know what these dreams mean, and the, the one who was spared in prison remembers these dreams. He tells Pharaoh that in prison there is a man who can answer and who can validate and who can confirm what these dreams mean. Pharaoh calls Joseph up. Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams, and Joseph is given a place of authority and power and rises up to be the second in command of all of Egypt. Seven years of plenty come. The grain houses and the storehouses are filled to the brim. Then seven years of famine come. Nations around Egypt hear that there is a great and plentiful stock of food. Nations travel to Egypt to buy food. Some members of one particular nation were the, 12, or, sorry, were the brothers of Joseph. Joseph recognizes them. And Joseph brings them into the palace. And the brothers are in fear of Joseph, thinking that Joseph would put them to death. Instead, Joseph reconciles his relationship with them restores his relationship with them, and brings them to live in Egypt. The brothers, their wives, their children, the great nation of Israel would be a sojourner in a foreign land. And if you remember, God revealed to Abraham a dark fate that would fall over his descendants while they were in Egypt. Years and years had passed. The brothers are there. However, after about, however, a time came when a new pharaoh arose who did not know Joseph. When a new pharaoh arose who did not know Joseph, he had great fear the Israelites would overthrow the kingdom of, of Egypt, and he puts them in captivity and bondage of slavery. And for generation after generation, they served tirelessly in Egypt. However, there was a time when there was a cry out when the Israelite, first, or the Israelite boys were to be put to death, and a great cry rises up through Egypt as the Israelite children are killed. However, there was one who was spared and saved. His name was Moses. And Moses grew, ironically, in the palace of Pharaoh. One day, through a series of events, Moses is exiled out of Egypt, is in wilderness. He marries. He begins to serve his father-in-law as a shepherd. Moses, as a shepherd, is out tending to a sheep one day, and he encounters the Lord. The Lord reveals himself to Moses in the form of a fiery, burning bush. God placed a commanding on Moses to return to Egypt to lead the Israelites out of slavery, and God would set them free. Through a series of warnings and plagues, God continually hardened and softened Pharaoh's heart until the tenth and final plague. Then the tenth plague was this. On the tenth day of the first month of the year, an angel would come through the land of Egypt. He will take the life of the firstborn of every household. A great cry of pain will come through Egypt like none has ever been known. Moses warned the people of Israel of this. Take a spotless, perfect lamb, shed its blood, then the blood painted on the doorposts of your home. As the angel passes through and passes over, he will see the blood of the lamb covering your home, and he will pass over it, and he will spare your home. The Israelites did this. The angel came through the land of Egypt, and he took the life of every firstborn of every house that was not protected by the blood of the lamb. No home was spared. From the firstborn of Pharaoh to the firstborn calf of the field, all who were not covered by the blood of the lamb were killed that night. A great cry resounded out through all of Egypt, and in his grief and pain, Pharaoh demanded that Moses and all of Israel leave Egypt immediately. 
In great haste, the Israelites gathered up all they had. They go to their neighbors and they take from their Egyptian neighbors salt, gold, and silver, wealth, financial means to rise up and be a great nation as God had given in the vision to, 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 to pass in the past to Abram. But God hardens the heart of Pharaoh after Pharaoh sends them out of Israel. The Israelite, I'm sorry, out of Egypt. The Israelites are fleeing. God hardens the heart of Pharaoh so that he would have glory. If you would, please turn to Exodus chapter 14. Pharaoh has sent his great army to hunt them down and return to slavery. Exodus 14, starting in verse 10. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. The people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt you have taken us out here to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in Egypt by bringing us out here? Is this not what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone so that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord will he'll work for you this day. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see them again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff. Stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. That the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. The Lord was faithful. He divides the waters of the Red Sea. He rose up a great and mighty wind that divided the seas to the east and to the west. On one side was Egypt, the land of slavery and death. The other side was the path to the promised land of salvation and hope. The Israelites quickly raced through the other side into freedom. However, because of Pharaoh's heart and hope, heart, his determination to return Israel back, Pharaoh was blinded and leads his army straight into death. As the waters came crashing down around them, drop down to verse 30. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the land of the, I'm sorry, from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. God used Moses to lead the Israelites from a land of slavery and death, but all the while pointed to one who was greater. One who is coming to be the blessed promised seed of Adam. The one who is coming to bless all peoples of the earth. The promised descendant of Abraham. The one who would be the sacrificial son that the heavenly father would not spare. But by shedding his blood would be bring peace to the nations. And one who will descend from a heavenly throne down a heavenly ladder to come to the earth to be a blessing to all peoples. And through him alone will all peoples ascend into the heavens. The one who would be the true Passover lamb, whose blood shall be shed to protect not only the firstborn, but to all who believe in him. The one who would be the dry path that we may cross over through, that leaves sin and death to bring us to promise of hope and salvation. Through a long and difficult journey, the Israelites finally enter the promised land. And they are ruled for generations by judges who oversee the nations and its leaders. However, the faithfulness of Israel often becomes weak and impatient. They demanded an earthly king like every other nation had, the same God who had promised to make them a great nation, the same God who had brought them out of Egypt, who had divided the waters to give them restoration and redemption, was no longer good enough for the Israelites. The Israelites wanted an earthly king, so they appoint a tall, handsome warrior named Saul. However, Saul is not a very good king. His heart is not for God. And the Lord mourns and regrets over him being the king of his people. 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. 1 Samuel 16 says, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. So Samuel goes to the home of Jesse. And Jesse brings him out, almost all of his sons. They're all tall, strong, handsome men, and each one of them looks like they could be a great king of Israel. But according to 1 Samuel 16, 7, 
The Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on appearances or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So Samuel asked Jesse, he says, Where are your sons? The Lord has said that from your house will be the next king of Israel. Where are the rest of your sons at? And he said, There's one. There's one who is the youngest son. He is out in the fields tending to a sheep. His name is David. Samuel says to bring him here. Bring him to me. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesse goes and brings David to Samuel. The Lord anoints and confirms that David is to be the next king of Israel. As David is anointing king, at the same time, there's a, nation, there's a war waging against the Philistine nation. The warriors of Israel are out of battle with the, nation of, uh, the armies of Philistine. Some time has passed. David's brothers are at the battlefront, at the lines. David has some supplies given to him from his father to bring to the brothers. When he gets out there, he delivers the supplies, and he says, where's the battle at? The brothers look at him and say, why are you here? You only want to be here to get glory and to get honor. And he says, no, I came to see what's going on. The war is waging, and there's a mighty warrior, a Philistine named Goliath. Goliath is a giant of a man, and he's valiant, and he's pretty treacherous too. The Philistines are standing in triumph because Goliath is like their champion. The armies of, Is <coughs> excuse me, the armies of Israel are watching and cowering in fear as the Philistines mock their God. David does not stand for this. David says, I will go and I will fight him. They said, you're no match for him. He said, I will have the Lord with me. They give him armor, they give him weapons, all of which are too big for David. David says, I have fought wolves and I have fought bears protecting my sheep and I'll take what I need. David takes a slingshot and a stone and he goes into the battlefield. Obviously, a little boy compared to a giant of a warrior is a laughing stock to the Philistine nations. But listen, listen to what David says in 1 Samuel 17. In 1 Samuel 17, 45 through 7, 47. Then David said to the Philistine, You come with me with a sword, with a spear, with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you down and I will cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines to this day, to the birds of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with a sword and spear. For this battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. David goes out with one single shot from his slingshot, knocks Goliath in the head. Goliath falls over dead. Goliath is lying there in defeat and death. David picks up Goliath's own sword and does exactly what he promised to do. He lifts Goliath's sword above his head, strikes it down, removes Goliath's head. Goliath's head is then pulled up in David's hand, and he shows it to the Philistines who run and cower in fear. Their champion had been defeated by a warrior of the one true God of Israel. David finally takes his rightful place as king over all of Israel. David rules Israel for many, many years. One day David decides that he is unfit to live in this palace if his God does not live as a home. So he decides that he wants to build a temple for God. God says, I do not live in a temple made by human hands. God gives, Sam, I'm sorry, God gives David a vision of a temple, though. And he says, your son will build this temple. His son was Solomon. And Solomon builds the temple to the Lord. And through the succession from David to Solomon, it leads to a line of kings that would be kings over all Israel that would be one day an eternal kingdom. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7, starting in verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will rise up after your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish a kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom, talking about Solomon, forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. 
Though many of the kings in the line of David were wicked, wicked kings, there would come to be a point in the line of David where the kingdom would be forever established with a truly righteous king that would sit on the throne forever. Though there would be a period in Israel's history where the earthly kingdom would be destroyed, the kingdom would be torn apart, the true eternal throne of Israel remain steadfast and would not depart from the descendants of David forever. That one day there will be one sitting on the throne as king who would be a blessing to all the peoples of the earth. That promised seed of Adam that brings victory over the enemy. The promised descendant of Abraham to bless all nations. The one who would be the sacrifice not spared, whose blood would be shed for forgiveness of sin. The one who would descend down from the heavenly ladder so that we on earth may ascend up into the heavens through him. The one who will be the true Passover lamb that will be shed, whose blood will protect those who have faith. The dry path we can cross over from death and defeat into salvation and redemption and victory. The one who, like David, would be a shepherd to his flock. A mighty warrior who conquers his enemies and will rule over his people as king on a throne forever and ever. And as our story is starting to wrap up, it brings us towards the end of the Old Testament to a time when the kingdom of Israel was split into two, a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, where people have been in and out and in and out of captivity and exile, where wicked king after wicked king has betrayed the Lord. And yet the Lord remains faithful. And during this time, the Lord has raised up prophets, prophets who would lead and guide the people of Israel. Of these prophets, one of them was named Isaiah. And Isaiah sought to lead Israel to repentance before the Lord. And through him, the Lord gave Isaiah prophecies of hope that was coming. Listen to what Isaiah says first in Isaiah 7 and then also in Isaiah 9. Isaiah 7, verse 13 through 14. And he said, Hear, O then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men? That through you you may weary my God also. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And in chapter 9, 6 through 7, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness, From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. 700 years pass before this prophecy is fulfilled. There was a virgin named Mary. Luke chapter 2 records in verses 30 through 33 in Luke chapter 2. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and the kingdom there shall be no end. This baby boy would soon arrive, born to a virgin mother, sitting on a throne as the king who would be a blessing to all the peoples of the earth, the one who is finally the promised seed that we have longed for to bring victory over the enemy, the one who will be the descendant of Abraham that blesses all nations and all peoples. The one who would be the provided sacrificial son, whom the heavenly father would not spare, but with the shedding of his life and his blood will bring peace peace to all nations in the resurrection of his life. The one who will descend down a heavenly throne so that we in faith may rise up into the heavens through him. The one who will be the true Passover lamb, whose blood shall be shed to protect not only the firstborn, but to all of us who believe and have faith in him. The one who will be the dry path that we can cross to leave behind slavery to our sin and death and step into a new land of salvation and promise that God has made for us. The one who, like David, will be a shepherd to his flock. A mighty warrior who will conquer his enemies, who will rule over us, his people, as our king on a mighty throne forever and ever. Emmanuel, God with us, a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, son of the most high God, the everlasting father, prince of peace, whose government and peace shall know no end, who will sit on the throne of David and will rule over the house of Jacob forever and his righteousness and forevermore and his name will be Jesus. And this is the Jesus that we look forward to in this coming Christmas season. This is the Jesus that we fall at our knees and worship. 
And this is the Jesus who lived a life we could never live, laid his life down on a cross, was pierced for our transgressions, was crushed for our iniquities, so that in him all peoples may be forgiven and all hope may be glorified through him and his restoration. Maybe you don't know this, Jesus. Maybe you don't have a relationship with this promised seed, the Redeemer, the Savior, the Wonderful Counselor, the mighty king. I would love to introduce you to my Jesus and tell you about who he is and what he has done for you so that you can have a relationship with him and a hope with him. As we lead into worship, I will be here at the front. If you just want to pray, I'll be glad to pray with you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for who you are. Thank you that ever since the beginning, your plan was always to redeem your people. The promised seed that would give hope. That would be our salvation. The lamb whose blood would be shed. The one who we can ascend in, into the heavens through. The one who would be our true warrior, king, and our shepherd. Bring salvation to a promised and heavenly land. Thank you for your son, Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen.